people buy from people. It's cliche. And your employee base is going to be connected to 10 times as many people as your brand accounts will ever be. So as a marketer, how can you leverage that huge network? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Confessions of a B2B Marketer podcast. Today, we are joined by Jason Bradwell of B2B Better to jump into what he's seeing. He's working right now with larger enterprise B2B companies and also his thoughts on lead gen and how he actually sells his own services. Let's jump into that conversation right now. Jason, welcome to the show. Nice to see you, Tom. How are you doing? Very good. It's a nice mic setup you got up there. Which mic is that? This is a Samsung Q2U. I've had it for three years now, ever since I started doing my podcast. I'm probably at the point now where I should be upgrading it to something different, but I don't know. It's treated me well so far. Still got a few more laps in it, I think. It sounds beautiful and combined with the exposed brickwork and the plant in the background, it seems like we're well set up. I'm clearly talking with an experienced podcaster, but we're going to get to that later. Yes. So as I mentioned to you beforehand, there's kind of three things I want to cover. First of which is about your maybe controversial take on lead generation. And then we have one more thing, which I'm not going to say now. And then finally, I want to dig into more about like how you market yourself with your show and with your community. So if that sounds good, I'd love to jump in. Let's do it. And talk about something you mentioned about lead generation not necessarily being a bad thing, because right now, everybody, including myself, is hating on lead generation. So lead generation. I think a lot of the advice that you see on social media needs a huge amount of context before it can be taken and implemented in the day-to-day work of a marketer. And this whole kind of rise of don't be, but don't build a lead gen strategy, focus on demand gen. To me, they seem like they're two sides of the same coin. And particularly for organizations that are like the ones I work for, which large enterprise, well-established sales-driven organizations, the idea of putting out content and it being driven to the website and in turn that leading to pipeline and revenue is not always so black and white. It's not always so clear cut. Right. If you've been working for an organization that's been in the market for 30 plus years and it's got a relatively small TAM, you can do a lot of really effective marketing that helps move customers down the funnel. But when they're ready to buy, they are going to go to the person that they've known for the last 20 years already in the company. They're not going to go through the website. So how do you track that? How do you measure that? Well, if you collect their details as a lead and you can identify what marketing touch points they've engaged with that have ultimately influenced the creation of revenue or pipeline and then revenue. That in a lot of organizations is really as far as the kind of marketing input can be. So yeah, I think where a lot of companies drop the ball when it comes to lead generation is that they optimize a strategy to just hit a number, to hit a quota of new names that they can hand over to sales. And then that handover occurs and things start to break down. I think that lead generation is an effective strategy and you can optimize against it as long as that there is a clear understanding between both sales and marketing and the company as a whole of how are we going to treat those leads once we've captured them. Once we've got those names in the database, Have we done the due diligence to actually qualify and figure out the intent of those leads before they go over to the sales team for a cold pitch? That's where I think a lot of companies drop the ball. And I think it's not a huge lift to fix. It's just about being more deliberate and mindful around how are we treating these contacts? What do the nurture sequences look like? How are we measuring intent? And just raising the bar, raising the threshold on when they get handed over to sales. So it isn't necessarily something wrong with lead generation. It's good to get the contact information in. What's the challenge or what people may be failing at is what they do once they have the leads inside the CRM. Exactly. I mean, I think when you actually drill it down, this whole kind of demand generation versus lead generation, we're all trying to get to the same place, right? It's about building an audience. It's about building a database of own contacts that through effective marketing, we can nurture to the point of them being 
ready to buy from us, right? It's the same bloody thing. But leads have just gotten a bad rap over the last couple of years. And it's quite right that if we are just optimizing to hit a number and then we don't give a shit about what happens to those leads once they're handed over to sales, that is a flawed strategy. But inherently, collecting contact information of our prospective buyers and creating high quality nurture sequences to move them along the funnel, that is not a bad strategy. <laughs> and it works very, very well for a lot of very successful businesses. So I guess the takeaway here is lead gen, not bad. How you treat those leads, that's what needs consideration. There we go. You used the interesting term that you said owned contacts. I think there is a distinction that maybe not all marketers really get, but it's quite important. Could you dig more into what you mean by that? When I, when I say own contacts, it's really, do you have their email address? Have they put their hand up and said, yes, we want to be contacted by you. We want to have a relationship with you even before we may be in a position where we want to buy from you. I've used the term own contacts before on LinkedIn. And I came under a little bit of heat. Can you ever really like own a contact? Is that how you should be approaching it? I think we're just getting into semantics, to be totally honest. Call it an audience, call it a community, call it a mailing list, call it whatever the hell you want. At the end of the day, there is huge value in having the email address of prospective buyers in a database that you can run nurture sequences against. So when I'm saying owned audience, it's really defined by that. You go in and you consult with these like big enterprise level companies. What's like one of the things that you go in and you're like, oh, wow, these people are not doing this. And it's a super quick fix. And then you fix it and they're like, wow, Jason's amazing. <laughs> Did you have any of this? <laughs> super quick fixes. I'm sure there are a couple that will come to mind. I'm happy to kind of like rapid fire through them in a second. But just the main thing that I see is the lack of a joined up CRM that marketing and sales can both that can both access and strategize off. It's not a quick fix. It's not an easy one to go out and implement a CRM in a business that has been used to a certain set of antiquated processes for a long time. It's a steep learning curve for a lot of organizations. But really having a CRM that both sales and marketing share is the cornerstone of any modern day successful go-to-market strategy. If you don't have it, you cannot effectively market and sell your company. Full stop, point blank, end of story. It is shocking how many eight, nine figure businesses out there do not have this kind of system in place, who are still running or are still collecting, capturing and analyzing information on new business opportunities off of spreadsheets. So that for me is the most shocking thing and the thing that I think most projects start with. If, if that's not in place, we need to figure that out. In terms of quick wins, I think just repurposing existing content like most B2B organizations, whether you're a kind of high volume, low price point SaaS or big seven, eight figure ACV enterprise solutions provider, you've created content in some capacity, whether it's public facing, blogs, podcasts, videos, or internal facing, one on one case studies, decks, sales enablement, collateral, etc. Your website, that is a piece of content in a sense. So you have all these artifacts already with the most organizations I walk into. And they've only ever been published once or utilized once. And then they've just been kind of shelved and never looked at again. But there's still like a huge amount of long tail evergreen value there to unlock. So quick win, do an audit of everything that you've produced internal, external, and figure out how you can repurpose it, reutilize it across different channels. Because a lot of these organizations, they don't have in-house content marketing teams or even external content marketing teams. So just the concept of like going out there and just creating a bunch of new stuff can be somewhat daunting, particularly in the short term. So just look at what you've already got. And I'm sure with a bit of elbow grease, you can polish it up and replatform it across different channels and just start getting that content marketing machine going. Nice. The first point on the CRM, is that really like the marketer's responsibility? Should there be like sales ops or marketing ops that should be working on that? Or does it not matter? They just have to get it done. Well, I think a lot of these organizations, they probably wouldn't have sales or rev ops in house if they don't have a CRM in place already. But I think marketers are the ones who typically feel the pain first. And as such, they're the ones that usually become the standard bearers of getting a new system in place. Sales, very easy to measure the success. Are we hitting revenue targets? Yes, no. How we get there, kind of irrelevant, but it's do we get there? Marketing in these organizations, which are typically considered a support function, 
more of a cost center than a profit driver, hence why budgets are slashed when we're in the kind of macroeconomic environment we're in at the moment. To be able to build credibility within the organization and have a seat at the table when it comes to resource allocation at the end of the year, you need to be able to prove your ROI. And you can only do that if you have a CRM in place where you can track that journey from, here's all the marketing stuff we're doing up at the top. How does that translate down into pipeline? Sourced or influenced? You can't do that if you don't have a CRM. So you're going to feel that pain very keenly and very quickly. And as such, may not be your responsibility, right? Theoretically, but practically speaking, you're the ones that are going to be really pushing for it to get done because ultimately it influences your success within the organization. Do you have any tips for any B2B marketers listening? that may want to improve their relationship with the sales team. Yeah, I mean, sales and marketing alignment is a really big issue in these kind of organizations that I typically work with because that usually is none. <laughs> the only time these two functions speak to each other is when there's a big event coming up and marketing are doing a booth. Sales want to know what it looks like. <laughs> I'm being somewhat kind of flippant about it, but just to illustrate the point. So sales and marketing alignment is really, really important. I think it kind of boils down to three things. Goals, are we all working towards the same common objective, revenue? Just split it out across the funnel, all the way from lead, subscriber, MQL, SQL, opportunity, customer, very simple funnel. What metrics do marketing own? What metrics do sales own? And are we talking about these metrics and where we stand on each of them regularly? So that's the first thing, getting everyone on the same page in terms of goals and moving in the same direction. The second is communication. Like, are we talking to one another? Do you have a weekly call in the diary where sales and marketing are coming together and they're talking about win loss analysis? They're talking about competitor spotlights. They're talking about the progress of marketing campaigns. They're reviewing their SLA agreement, what have you. It sounds really simple, like it's, but the, the number of organizations that don't have that weekly touch point between these two departments is high. So that's a very simple, easy fix. Just start talking to one another. And then third is about execution. Do we have? the project management software in place that everyone can really understand what's happening when and what blockers exist and who needs to complete task A in order for task B to be closed off, what have you. I mean, there's so many free tools on the market now. Trello, ClickUp, Asana, a Monday, I should say. There are so many. There's no excuse to not have a piece of project management software accessible by both sales and marketing in place. I really like the idea of a buddy system when it comes to communication. Can you pair up a sales and a marketing professional together? And there's no real like hard and fast objective other than just spend time together, learn about each other's roles, figure out how you can help each other do better. I think that can be really, really useful. Yeah, just having some sort of central repository where, where marketing and sales assets are stored. That's also really important for alignment. It's really, really frustrating and it wastes a lot of time where every single time sales needs an artifact that they've seen some point in the past, they've got to go to marketing. Marketing have got to like trawl through their folder structure and try and find the relevant asset, send it over. Oh, it's not in the right format. Can you send it again? Just housekeeping. Be organized, be tidy, just have that repository in place and make sure everyone understands how to use it. Do you ever like go into booth companies and there's like not a dispute, but the relationship isn't great and then you have to act as the middleman? I think a lot of my work is not about pointing blame at anybody. It's more about highlighting opportunities. The organizations I work with are ones that for all intents and purposes are very successful businesses. They are bringing in millions of revenue, tens of millions in some cases, hundreds of millions. That's a really, really great place to start. If you're going into a young startup that haven't yet hit product market fit, they're really work trying to develop a marketing strategy that's going to help them get the few dollars through the door. That is a really tough gig. And there are a lot of great marketing agencies and freelancers out there who relish that kind of challenge. Me, I prefer going into organizations where there is already a, an established degree of success. And it's now more about figuring out how can we optimize this existing structure to accelerate this level of growth and success. So when I go into these organizations, it's less about pinning the blame. Hey, marketing have done this bad. Sales have done this bad. It's more about highlighting, okay, we're doing some things right. Here are the opportunities. And yeah, I guess you act as a mediator in a sense, but it's a position of when you go into these situations, you know, they want you to be there. 
right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have hired you in the first place. So yeah, typically, everyone's pretty open minded to hearing me out. Makes sense. The one thing I used to do, which I think helped the relationship now, I was only in marketing, head of marketing role for like a year because I was not that good at it in the end. But um, I was not good at being employed. I think I was good at the marketing part. Anyway, what I used to do was I used to just go and sit. The sales and marketing team sat relatively close to each other, but I used to just get up, take my chair around and sit next to a salesperson, ask them to show me their last like five calls or whatever, and then just go through each one and ask them about the quality of the lead. And also if they found out about anything that influenced them before they bought. And I, that, I felt like that made the salespeople like me more. Do you think that's a good approach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, ultimately, sales just want to be able to sell and sell well. And anything that marketing can do to help them achieve that is obviously going to be well, well received. So I think, yeah, it's also a good practice as a marketer just to understand what our customers saying. Because sometimes, again, when you work in large enterprise environments, getting that first party data speaking directly to a client is not always possible. Like if your company is selling, not just influencing, but selling to the C-suite of a Fortune 500 company, you are very rarely going to get given one-to-one access with those clients directly because time, right? Like these are very, very busy, important people. They're not going to sit on a customer research call, right, for an hour. Whereas, so getting that information typically... The only place you can get it is through your sales colleagues. So sitting in on calls, running kind of win-loss analysis with sales colleagues, talking to kind of customer services, customer success, those are really all good approaches in terms of just bringing all these pieces together. All right then, Jason, let's get into the meat. Four levers solution providers can pull to generate demand and build pipeline. So four levers that you can pull to... If you're a solution provider, and what I mean by solution provider is that you may have a product within your organization, but it's usually tailored to the specific client requirements and packaged with services, professional managed services, just to be clear on what I mean by solution providers. When you're in that space, you're typically selling your expertise as much as you are selling your capabilities. Solution providers, you could think of things like cloud integration or data pipeline management, things like that, fairly commoditized services. So selling that expertise and that thought leadership is really, really important. It's it's your competitive mode and what helps you stand out. So doing something like launching a podcast, which I know is a bit cliche in B2B marketing circles, but launching a podcast can be a really effective way to do that, to build that credibility. And I think with launching a podcast, you just got to go into it with a certain mindset. What am I trying to achieve here? It's not about being the next Joe Rogan and getting millions of followers, but it's about having an opportunity to share your perspective on the industry, where it's going, and create an opportunity to invite existing and prospective clients onto that podcast to talk to them about their perspectives of the industry. So that can be a really powerful lever if you play it right. The second lever is a lot of these solution providers... Again, they have been around for a little while. They're not like fledging new startups. And as such, they may already have existing relationships with trade associations and trade publications and having some sort of sponsorship agreement, be it having a booth at an event, be it um, advertorial or whatever. I think post-pandemic, the need to really hold these trade associations and trade memberships and trade publications to account on achieving ROI from an investment is super important. I think the pandemic just completely rewrote the rule book on what trade association events look like. Is it still viable to be spending six figures on a trade show booth in 2023? Yes, if you've got the budget for it, but most companies is probably the money's better spent elsewhere. So going to your trade partners and saying, okay, this is how we used to do things, but now I want to be very clear with you on what my objective is lead generation, pipeline generation, revenue generation. What can you now do for me that's going to help me hit those objectives? And if you say logo placement, I'm going to walk out of this room. That's also a really important lever to pull. And the third and final one I'll say is, how can you develop your non-marketing colleagues into thought leaders? And it kind of ties up to my podcast point as well. People buy from people. It's cliche. And your employee base is going to be connected to 10 times as many people as your brand accounts will ever be. So as a marketer, how can you leverage that huge network? It's not about telling your colleagues, well, you have to post this and it has to be said in this way. I don't think you can do that. 
And I think that really builds a really poor culture around employee advocacy and social selling. But equipping them with the tools and the support they need to go out there and be advocates on the behalf of your brand independently is a really powerful tool for solution providers in terms of growing pipeline. Yeah, because it's more the carrot than the stick strategy where you're saying, here are the things that can make you amazing. And then if people actually take that and they want to drive themselves, they have the motivation, they can have much better results than you just forcing them to share your company LinkedIn posts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the key thing here is to start small. Like, I keep going back, I sound a bit like a parrot, but these organizations, these well-established organizations who have been around for years, if not decades, certain sales professionals within that organization will just never change the way they do business. And that's fine, right? Like if they're succeeding, that's cool. But the idea of being suddenly becoming active on social media, if they've never even opened up a LinkedIn account is probably a bit of a stretch. So find the group within the business that is already showing signs or signals that they would have an appetite to be social employee advocates, maybe they already are posting on social media independently, just not about your company. Maybe they are the ones picking up the phone to marketing more frequently and saying, how can we work together to help me achieve my revenue targets? Those are the superstars that you want to start a campaign around because they're the ones that are going to be bought in and more likely to get short-term success, which in turn is then going to have a ripple effect across the rest of the organization. I tell you, when one salesperson sees another salesperson generating revenue through social selling, they're going to be lining up. They're going to be <laughs> lining up to get a little bit of that action. So start small and grow incrementally. Got it. So we can start a podcast, potentially take one of these internal people, make them the host of the show so we can help boost their exposure anyway. We're going to equip a small group of people in the organization to start getting engagement on social in theory. We're not going to force, we're going to equip. And then the middle one was also be strategic, it seems, about trade shows or trade publications, about potentially investing there. I actually have an example that hits all three of these. Yes. I was working with a client who, well established, for many years had had a relationship with a particular trade association. And that relationship was pretty conventional in that it was predominantly a kind of six by six booth and maybe a little bit of advertorial on the trade publication. This trade publication had recently started a podcast series. So what we pitched to that publication was, well, let's create up a separate series that will be co-hosted by one of our executives with you. So we want your kind of editor co-host it with us. And what we'll do is we'll interview prospective clients of ours about what they see happening in the space. What trends are they most passionate about and concerned about? So that was hitting all three marks, right? It was a podcast, which enabled this customer to speak to customers of theirs that they had historically had a tough time breaking through with. It was squeezing more value out of the trade association partnership. Launching a podcast as a brand is tough if you've never done it before and you have a relatively small audience. Trade associations, trade publications inherently have already large existing audiences. So we were able to leverage that and kind of build on borrowed land, so to speak. And then third, it was taking a non-marketing colleague and it was really positioning them as the thought leader. They weren't getting on this podcast as a guest where they were talking about, well, here's why our company is great. They were being positioned as the thought leader, the host, the person who was leading the conversation alongside the guests. So that was just one good example that, that hit all three of those levers. So did you guys offer to pay for the production of the show in exchange for them promoting it to their audience? Like what's the commercial arrangement? The commercial arrangement was that everything was handled on the trade, associate, trade publication side. They work, they are content creators inherently, and they already had a podcast series. So the relationship, the commercial arrangement was instead of doing, let's say, the six by six booth at this event that we go to every year that we really struggle to attribute ROI against, let's do this podcast series. You handle all the production, you handle all the sourcing of the guests, we'll give you a list, but you handle the sourcing because the guests are more likely to say yes when it's coming from you, trade partner, than it is coming from us. You book the studio space, you do all the editing, all the production, all the social assets, what have you. All we'll do is we'll turn up, we'll do our research, we'll host the episode, and then we will promote it across our channels after the fact. That was the commercial arrangement. It makes total sense. I think it's only fair, right? Like if you're paying this trade publication, who are content creators inherently, for some sort of sponsorship arrangement, they already have the capabilities to handle that likely much better than you will do as a brand. So if you can make it work, I'd go down that road. 
Well, certainly interesting outcomes. Like I assume the thought leader from your side built relationships with guests. Maybe we've got some deals there. But then in terms of anything from the listener side of the equation, was there any good results or insights? Yeah, there was some good insights. It was the second most listened to podcast series of this trade publications. It was the second most listened to podcast from this trade publication for that year. And it had 85% completion rate if memory serves, which means that 85% of listens went 75% or more of that particular episode which is really, really high, um, all things, considering these were like 30, 40 minute episodes. Whether or not it generated pipeline, look, it's very, very hard to attribute podcasts to revenue. But again, thinking about this enterprise sales cycle, there were eight conversations had, eight relationships created off the back of this podcast with clients or prospective clients who before the the company was struggling to get in touch with using kind of more conventional cold outbound, cold outreach sales messaging. So when you're operating across the enterprise sales cycle, relationships are everything. So from that perspective, the client considered it very much a win. Nice. Now I want to shift gears a little bit to how you create content slash market yourself and also about the community that you're building as well. So first question is, your like core offering, I think, is you going into these larger companies and sorting out their marketing. How do we get the people to come to you to be like, yes, we want to bring you in? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, I'm still in very early days of my business. It really started kind of beginning of 2023. And but that being said, I've been running my podcast. I've been writing my newsletter for three plus years at this point. And I started the podcast within the back of my mind, knowing that at some point in the future, I was going to want to set up my own business. And I was going to want to offer strategic marketing services. And I wanted to give myself as soft a landing as possible. So when I eventually did announce the fact that I was starting up B2B Better as a strategic marketing advisory firm, and I sent out that email, there were quite a high number of leads that came through the door almost immediately. People who'd been following me for years, knew how I saw the world, thought I could provide some value and wanted to get in touch to learn more. So I very much want to do as little, if any, cold outbound as possible over the course of the life of my business. So I think investing in content, doing the podcast, doing the newsletter, I consider as important as doing the client work because ultimately that's the fuel that's powering the engine. Roughly, what was the size of the email list, if you don't mind me asking? I just crossed 3,100 yesterday. Got it. And we got like around, let's say, 5 to 10 lead inquiries when you send that email, roughly? Yeah, about 5 to 10, I'd say. I would also say that from the podcast, this perspective, I'd done 70 plus episodes at the time when I decided to go full time with B2B Better. So I reached out to every single one of those guests, not to necessarily offer my services because a lot of my guests don't fit my core ICP, but just to let them know, hey, this is now happening. And if you hear of anyone or know of anyone who you think could be interested in this type of service, do let me know. And a bunch of leads came in through that as well. Amazing. A good friend of mine yesterday tweeted, Ronnie Higgins, your network is your net worth. I think he's totally accurate there. Not that he came up with that phrase, but he, him reminding me of it. It's totally, totally true. And if you have in your mind an idea of setting up a business at some point in the future, the earlier that you can start building out your personal profile, in my experience, the easier it will be when you do eventually take that leap. Yeah, the classic starting a business journey is like, this is what I'm going to sell, then try and sell it. Versus this is actually how fame started, was you build the audience, decide what to sell to them, and then you already have people that like and trust you. So I think the email list is under a different brand called SaaS Marketer. I think it was around the same when I started fame and sent that email and then, yeah, got the first one or two customers from it. So very similar journey, but it's just, I don't know, it's much more seamless, I feel, than trying to then do cold outreach when you don't have any reputation. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying it's a guarantee because it isn't. But if you find yourself in a position where you are in full-time employment and you do have a bit of time on the weekends and the evenings that you cannot use for kind of freelance side hustle client work, the next best thing is to start investing in your personal brand. If for no other reason than you quite rightly highlighted there, to just learn what the market demands. What does the market need? I wouldn't say that I have 120% definitive clear idea on what the market demands right now. And I think the very first year in my business is going to be spent in the trenches doing the work 
and really refining the ideas I do have. But I'm like 80 to 90% there, which is far more than I would have been if I just spent the last three years sitting on my laurels doing nothing in regards to my personal branding and speaking to actual marketers. For sure. Jason, thank you so much for coming on, sharing the wisdom. So let's just recap. Combining, I think, podcast, trade publication relationships, and employee advocacy can be a powerful strategy for especially these large enterprise customers. And then, of course, if anybody wants to work with Jason, if you're taking on clients now, we're going to link to Jason's LinkedIn profile in the show notes, along with B2B Better, which is Jason's podcast focused on B2B. Anything else we should link to or mention? Yeah, my website and my company is the same name, www.b2b-better.com. But no, I'd love to connect with your audience on LinkedIn if they want to find me there. For sure. That link will be below as well. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Tom. Thank you to Jason, of course, for jumping on and being so generous with his wisdom. If you have any feedback about the show, as always, please go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leave an honest rating or review. If you do that, send me a screenshot and I'll get you a shout out in one of the outros of this show. And of course, thanks to you for listening.